Hello, my name is Derek Knowles, and I am a PhD student under Professor Grace Scow in the Stanford Nav Lab. Today, I'll be sharing about a open source Python library that our lab has developed, and uh, that works with GNSS measurements. So, this library we built and released last year and took inspiration from many previous GNSS libraries, many that were developed and released in this very conference. Um, and we developed this library in order to meet several design requirements. So I'll first in this presentation talk about some of those requirements in order to recap from our presentation last year. Um, and then I'll go into details of new functionality that we've released over the past year. And so uh, if you would like to know more about the details and implementation of this library, you can refer to our presentation from last year's conference. So the first this design requirement goal that we have, um, first is that it's written in Python. Uh, having it in Python allows us to uh, have a broader audience, as well as being able to integrate with machine learning and data science libraries um, that our, our lab uses um, and are beginning to become more, more profound um, and widespread as well. Um, it's also important for us that this library was modular, meaning that we can integrate many different types of data and run the same algorithms and visualization tools, as well as uh, that the library is well documented so that there are function level references for every function on our library as well as citations where uh, algorithms come from. Um, we wanted this library to be unit tested so this library has complete full testing coverage and this means that as we continue to expand and grow we can have confidence and our users can have confidence that the library will continue to work as expect expected. And then finally, uh, the library is easily extendable. So we have guides on how to contribute, um, as well as the modularity allows us to quickly add new types of functionality. Um, and this uh, ability to easily extend the library was tested over this past year as we implemented new functionality. So first I'll talk a bit more about those modular capabilities. So first off is that we allow um, and have integrations for many different types of data uh, that all come into the same uh, a unified nav data class. This allows us to run the same algorithms uh, further down the pipeline, um, but all from different, although the data sources may be different. So when using one of these pre-existing classes that we have in our library, there's no additional prep needed. So you can just uh, reference the file path to a Rhinex file or the data set directory. Um, as well as uh, behind the scenes, we change to consistent time formats. So some of these data sources use uh, time of week or UTC time or GPS time or different constellation times. Um, so we handle that and convert them all into the same time format as well as uh, that uh, frame of reference. So we use uh, ECF for a frame of reference. Um, as, as well as we allow for data inputs of CSV files or pandas data frames that allow users to quickly integrate um, outside sources uh, like Ublox data into uh, and make use of our library as well. So once that everything is in a this standardized nav data class, then you can make use of the various algorithms that we have. So we have algorithms for uh, estimating the positions of receivers, as well as calculating residuals, um, or performing fault detection and exclusion. Um, as well as uh, we have visualization functions for mapping trajectories on, on a, of receivers on a map, um, doing sky plots, as well as looking at individual rows of data and then finally, behind the scenes, um, we have many functions in order to get all of these, these previous algorithms to work, of um, including coordinate transforms, um, automatically downloading ephemeris, um, calculating the positions of satellites. Um, and so over this past year, we've been busy. Uh, and so 
what is highlighted in, in colors are functionality that was new or improved over just this past year. Um, and so since, since last year, 2022, uh, we've released eight new versions of Genesis Love Pi. Um, and we've also seen the, the use of our library continue to grow of hundreds of downloads, um, as well as increasing number of, of clones of our GitHub library. Um, and so um, we, we look to this as, um, as an indicator uh, that we can, uh, this is being used and that we will continue to add functionality to this library. And so the rest of this presentation will explain um, and detail uh, those new contributions by illustrating two example use cases. So the first is generating receiver and fault detection um, receiver location and fault detection baselines. Um, and then uh, the second will be adding satellite positions um, and velocities to received measurements. Um, so first I'll, I'll talk about this first example use case. So in this use case, so in this example use case, We'll start with pulling data from the 2022 Google Decimeter Challenge. We'll uh, convert that into our nav data frame. Um, we'll run a number of algorithms on that data um, and then map all of those on a trajectory. Um, so, um, so the first thing that we do is uh, we and uh, we can import our library um, as, and we have integration with Google Colab. You can simply pip install in Google Colab. Um, and then the first thing we do is we load this data into our uh, predefined classes uh, for the Android data set. Um, we load both the raw data as well as, as, well as the uh, ground truth data. Um, and then once it's, uh, the magic is that once in this standard format um, of a nav data frame, uh, we can easily call functions uh, for computing weighted least squares. So simply with this one function call of solve WLS, um, behind the scenes uh, it will run weighted least squares across all time measurements um, and compute that solution um, using unity weights as the default. However, um, if we want custom weight, then um, we can use our nav data frame to use uh, a row. Uh, say we want to have weights based off of the uh, pseudo range variance. Um, then we can use those custom weights in weighted least squares just with a, a simple argument of what row to use for the weights. Um, and then additionally, we have fault detection and exclusion baselines. Um, this method uses dual called Euclidean distance matrices. Um, and if you're interested in that, then I invite you to uh, watch my other presentation in session D3. Um, and so also using this same nav data class, we can easily call uh, solve FTE, fault detection and exclusion, um, and have a state estimate. And so finally, um, we can plot all of these on a interactive map, um, simply giving the argument of these computed state estimates, um, and then we have easily this visualization to qualitatively view how these different algorithms, the state estimates of these different algorithms are different. And so I've talked about this first example of generating a receiver location and fault detection baselines, um, and now Ashwin will talk about this second example. Hi, I'm Ashwin Kandere, also a PhD student in the Stanford Nav Lab, and I'm going to talk about how you can use GNSS LibPy to add satellite positions and velocities corresponding to measurements you've already received and recorded. So in this case, we're going to use SP3 precise orbits, we're going to use CLK clock products, 
And to show that we've actually computed these SV states, we're going to use weighted least squares to generate a state estimate, and then using that state estimate, show sky plot of the received satellite states. So first off, like Derek said, it's integrated with Google Colab, so you use pip install inside of Google Colab to install GNSS libpy, and you just import it like any Python module as GLP, and then you have this set of measures predefined shown on the left side of your screen that was saved as a CSV that you load into a nav data. Once you have all you need to do is call the function add SV states. In this case, we specify the source, which is precise. You can also specify the broadcast source, which will use .n or .rnx Linux navigation files. Here we also specify that it has to be verbose, so it's going to tell us what it's doing as it's doing those things. So it first showed us what files it had downloaded, and now it's telling us what SVs it's interpolating for. And you have the previous measurements, which had pseudo ranges and GPS millis, IDs for GPS, GNSS, and SV, now appended with the satellite positions, XSVM, YSVM, ZSVM in ECF, and the velocities, along with the clock bias and clock bias drift rate. So now that we have these satellite positions and velocities, we can use these to WLS, which we do. And now for this particular time, we have a WLS state estimate in XYZ, ECF, and the clock bias. It's also been converted to lat, long, and alt for more uh, plotting friendly cases. Finally, with this state estimate and the SP states that we've computed, we are going to plot a sky plot of what positions the satellites would be in from our estimated receiver state. You might ask, is it really that easy? Is all I need one function with two parameters? Only one if you're counting uh, non -default the default parameters? Yes, for you it is. But there's a lot that is actually going on under the hood inside of this add SV states function. The first step is it's going to load the fmls uh, corresponding to the measurements that you've actually received. So the measurements, as you noticed, have a time tag, which is in GPS uh, milliseconds since the start of the GPS epoch. And we also specified that we want to use precise orbits. So what load fml is, which is the function that add SV states is going to call behind the scenes, is going to do is it's going to take the fml type, which is precise, use it to determine that you want sp3 and clk files, and then get the sp3 and clk files that correspond to the timestamps you have from one of 17 sources that we've determined to give you these files reliably. It does the same thing if you want to use .n or .rnx files, you just have to specify broadcast and it's going to look for separate files. Once you get those files, it's going to load the files into a GNSS libpy nav data derived class of sp3 or clk which is going to convert all of the data into nav data and then also convert all of the times into GPS millis so that everything has the same timestamp. If you look at this plot on the right, this has the positions of all the satellites that were received as part of these SP3 or CLK files. However, you're not seeing all the satellites all the time and you don't need all of these satellites. So in the next step, what it's going to do is it's going to use an estimate of where you are to figure out the satellites that are in view of the receiver. These are the satellites that are in view of the receiver, but still, this is all of the data that was collected for the satellites that are in view of the receiver. There's still one thing that has to be done here, which is you need to interpolate for the SP3 and CLK files. You get data at periodic frequencies, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30, and you don't have any information on the satellite states in between. So what you do in this case is use a cubic spline and interpolate for the satellite state in between the given times. So if you see, the points on the plots are points at which we know the satellite states because of the sp3 file, and the lines connecting these points are interpolated states. Now that we have the interpolated states, you can query any time, and you're going to get the corresponding satellite position and velocity for that time. So in this case, we query for the GPS millis that was in the measurements, and get these satellites for that time, again shown as a sky blot from this location. So this is a short view of what happens behind the scenes when you call add SV states with precise FMLs. The result is more, the process is more or less similar when you're using broadcast, except we're using different algorithms to uh, calculate the SV state. SV states, positions, velocities, clock bias, and bias drift. 
Now, as Derek mentioned earlier, we have tutorials and function references. The tutorials, as you can see on the right, are Jupyter Notebook examples that walk you through steps of how to do certain things. For example, if you wanted to run the FMRS downloader on your own, this is how you would go about doing so. It's going to show you how to generate an example nav data with the time you want, and then how to use load FMRS. This is there for a lot of functions that you might need, including weighted least squares. If you wanted to run a weighted least squares estimate, you can refer to the tutorial, which is going to walk you step by step on how to do this. We also have standard GNSS references, more details on our standard nomenclature, the types of frames we're using, and the times we're using, alongside a fully documented module level reference. So in this case, for the snapshot module, you have this reference. You also have a handy link that is going to take you to the GitHub page. So you can actually see the code that is both being used to generate the documentation, as well as the code which is doing everything. All of this is directly accessible from our documentation website through the references tab. As Derek mentioned before as well, GNSS Slipby is easy to install. So if you're someone who's looking for an out-of-the-box solution, we host it on PyPy. So all you have to do is pip install GNSS Slipby and it's available for you. We also have Google Colab support that uses a similar command. If you're an advanced GNSS user and you want to use your own algorithms, you want to develop algorithms as extensions of what GNSS Libby has in them, you can clone the code from a GitHub repository and follow detailed step-by-step -step instructions that are in our documentation website that show you how to install all the relevant dependency packages and get GNSS Libby started on your system. So to summarize, GNSS Libby is a GNSS library in Python that is modular, well-documented, has full unit testing, and is easily extendable. You can use it to generate baseline solutions out of the box, or you can use it to write your own algorithms and extend whatever methods we have. Finally, if you want to look at our code, please use the QR code on the left side. There's also the URL that you can go to our GitHub to see the code. Similarly for the documentation, you can go to the read the docs page or use this QR code. Finally, please don't forget to check out our paper in the conference proceedings and thank you for viewing this presentation.